episode of the LOL Podcast, the official LOL Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Frankie Nunez, and with me we're going to have uh, Peter Hard. He's our former NFL defensive end. We've also got Jerry Jurgensen. He is a former CFL Canadian Football League front office executive. And uh, we're not going to waste any time because we're always all business here. So we're going to get straight into LOL football. Uh, our roundtable session, we're going to go to Peter Hard first. Tell me a player that's really stood out to you so far. So after watching last week's scrimmage, the, the one player that really stuck out to me was John Macca. Yeah, John Macca, all over the field, offense and defense. Tell me what you saw out of him. I mean, the guy was unstoppable. He never moved his feet. And a lot of people were questioning him in the second round. Yeah, I, I was And to see him come out and quiet the haters, he was, he was my number one guy that I day. mean, I think it's, it's unbelievable because John Macca is a guy we talked about last year had no catches in the championship final. And that a big result of that is from my player that I, I, I noticed a lot out of, which was Renzo. And it makes us all think, I know we've spoken about it before, what would Team Holmes have looked like last year with both Renzo and Macca? It could have changed their championship aspirations yeah, last year. Yeah, that injury changed the that whole... hand injury you know, was that. big. Uh, we've got Jerry here. Jerry, tell me who stuck out to you so far. Matt King just seems that he has exerted effort from week to week where he wants to install himself among the top tier of players in the league, he's been playing against seasoned veterans, whether it's uh, Ian Tully on a defensive side of the ball, and perhaps it doesn't play out as well as he would like all the time, but he's putting in reps at the highest yep. tier of the game. He's also catching a whole lot of balls, and I think that it's uh, I like Matt. I like Matt King a lot. It's a short stint. It's been a lot to see from a rookie, and I guess we might as well go all the way here and talk about Josh Piney too, and talk about all team homes, because... Renzo is getting every single one of these guys the ball. He's getting it to them on time. He's getting it to them in rhythm. They're scoring touchdowns. They're getting first downs. I haven't seen enough out of him on defense yet, personally, but I really like what I've seen from Team Holmes, and it's it's piloted by Renzo, and I think it's it's probably fitting for this episode that we're going to give Coach Holmes a little credit because we're going to have him later on the show for an interview. But what Coach Holmes has done between this playbook, between putting this roster together, which he got a lot of heat for on draft night, I'm flat out impressed with yeah, Coach Yeah, taking Holmes. Renzo in the first round was a big surprise. A lot of people thought he would fall to the second, maybe five, maybe six. Yeah. Taking him third overall, he is the kind of player that elevates everybody else. His quarterback play is amazing, makes everybody on the field and play better. I think that's why he ends up going Renzo instead of J.J. A lot of people thought J.J., but but every pick. So he takes Renzo, people were thinking J.J. Second round, he takes Maka. People were thinking plenty of other people other than Mac. I mean, there were plenty of players on the board. Taking the rookie in the third. Right. Took a, took a rookie in the third round. Then he takes Josh in the fourth round. And, and I remember when Frank got up there, Commissioner Frank got up there, he quote-unquote, he said, a lot of people are going to be upset about this pick. <laughs> and there it was, Josh Piney. So every round, he took someone you didn't expect, and clearly he had a plan. He stuck to that plan. And we're, we're seeing it pay off. Uh, I've I been impressed. agree with you more. Frankie, All the name of the game with Lorenzo thus far in scrimmage action has been production. The man has been effective Unreal. in moving north and south and around the edges is just diabolical. The kid has been dropping them on dimes and people have been reeling them in. It's been, it was interesting to watch on Sunday. You know, they went up against the roadies a ton in that round robin and the roadies decided they were not going to rush Renzo and he did the veteran thing he sat back there and waited all day and had an opportunity to pick him apart I, I can't imagine and and we'll get we'll, we'll get into the roadies later there's no question about that that's a whole nother subject but I can't imagine that's the way people are going to attack Renzo going into this era it doesn't work I think if anybody had a game plan going into week one, it has changed after right. that scrimmage. <laughs> exactly. I think that he has changed the mind of coaches on how they're going to game plan around him. You know, leave the roadies not having anybody on the line. I mean, just Mistake. let him sit back there Mistake. all day. And that's the problem. The guys can hold. You know, you could hold a guy like Maka for a few seconds. Right, but when but you give Renzo seven, eight seconds on the ball. And I get the logic. I get the mindset is we don't want to rush Renzo because he's going to beat us with our legs. Let him. Prove it. You know, you can't give him all day. He's going to find someone. Matt King's got speed. Josh has speed. Macca has elusive speed. And even Holmes himself has speed. And let's not even, we can't forget Matt Warner either. Matt Warner had two huge catches. You're going to put someone like Dan O'Shea on Matt Warner. Guess what? Matt Warner's going to win that match a lot of times. So you, you have to rush him. You have to make him make a decision. That's for sure. 
And from a front office perspective, just as a catalyst, he activates other players on his team. Lorenzo Labazetta just sees a scoring potential in he just makes players around him better. Players around him score. So we talked about almost every, we almost did a team breakdown at Team Homes. They were that good on Sunday. Uh, I noticed none of us were going to pick players from the neighborhood roadies. And that's going to bring us to our top story of the day, which is what's going on in neighborhood roadie land. Uh, this team has uh, had a little bit of turmoil, a little bit of chaos, and it goes all the way back to draft night. Uh, what did you notice from a on-field perspective about what they were doing wrong, what they got wrong, and what they need to clean up? It didn't seem like they came in with much of a game plan. That's for sure. Um, That's for sure. You know, you draft a guy like Justin O'Shea in the first, you take the best available player with Nick Del Monte in the second. MVP. And you think, yeah, for, yeah, last year's MVP, and you think that that's going to be a solid base. But to come in with no game plan, you know, they're not enough to, you know, just to go out there and be just talent on the field. You got to have a plan. This league has been elevated over the last. I mean, we're talking tenth year yeah. of the LOL league. People and play. You know? Listen, I get it. It's it's week one, and you know maybe this is a bit of an overreaction. I'm 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 not going to sit here and say that's not possible, but. The things we're seeing aren't just like, oh, well, these guys weren't prepared for week one. They're feeling each other out. The things we were seeing from draft night to today is Nick Del Monte visibly upset at the addition and acquisition of Ken Silver, draft round uh, draft round three. Uh, and he's he's pissed. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it. He doesn't want to play with Ken. He's never wanted to play with Ken, going back to when they were 10 years old. They hate each other. And... Uh, I, I, I got to wonder what that draft pick was, you know, it, it shouldn't have been made, that draft pick. They can't play together. I will give two positives for the roadies, and this is not anything to do with gameplay. Nick Del Monte showed up. Oh, yeah. Which I which, which is very questionable <laughs> after after the, the Ken Silver pick. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Ken Silver let me down. You know, they let the roadies down. You know, he, he on did. both sides of the ball, you know, he, he wanted to play, he... he was gonna, yeah. I mean, the the first of all, we're gonna say the zone defense, scrap it. It didn't work. I, the plan to play Ken Silver at deep safety. I, what, what's going on with that plan? That's a terrible plan. A, B, uh, offense. Who's the quarterback? Are we gonna find out who the quarterback is? Do they have an idea who the quarterback is? I got inside information today that at Wednesday practice, Justin O'Shea was working out privately with Hardcore Johnny. Hardcore Johnny was throwing him balls. If is that the answer? I hope not. I don't know what the answer here is. But we also have information that this is not just an on-the-field thing. The, apparently, there's multiple reports that during draft night, after the party was over, people went up to the hotel room, and Nick Del Monte was staging some sort of assault of Frank Samisa. Yeah. Police had to be called. I don't know what went on that night. I know that you guys were at the party. Did you hear anything from Nick Del Monte other than his displeasure with Ken Silver. Did you hear about this possible jumping of Frank Zemisa? You have to understand, he's a fairly mercurial athlete to begin with. There's no doubt to a tremendous amount of talent, but with it comes a fairly mercurial attitude that if given the wrong ingredients can cause sort of a nuclear meltdown. I'm a specialty in these uh, sort of situations as a front office uh, guru, one might say. But neither of you heard anything about him possibly trying to have someone assaulted on draft night. None of you heard anything. The rumors were flying around that the commissioner <clears throat> that, was going down that night. Yeah, I That mean, is still pending uh, some legal litigation, <laughs> and he's believed to be still at large. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I mean, I don't know how true that stuff is, and, and I don't know what kind of legal measures were taken, but he's clearly not very psyched about about being on this team. Now, do you think that this team has enough time? We know they have enough time, but do you think this team has enough know-how and enough knowledge to put it back together? That's the question. And if so, where does it start for those guys? They have the talent. I think sure. it all boils down to what they decide to do with the talent. The playbook right. needs to be drawn up. It didn't seem like they came in with much. They have to plan to get Nick Del Monte involved, Del Monte inv uh, yeah, Justin O'Shea involved. Who would you go with at quarterback? I mean, you, you've been on the field. You've seen these guys play. Who do you think has the best chance of being the, the, the starter for game day? I spoke with Nick Muse and a couple of the roadies players, and they're thinking about going with a dual quarterback. Sure, which um, we've seen Dan win a championship with. Dan O'Shea won a championship with the Smokes with that. Between Ian Tully, Renzo, and himself, they, they went with a different quarterback every time. I get it. It keeps ba defenses off balance. But who's the crunch time passer? Who's the guy on third and ten where you've got to pick it up? You know, Who's the guy with the game on the line where you want to see the right arm show off the talent? Like, 
I don't know who that guy is. They obviously don't know who that guy is. And that's something you probably want to know. I mean... Big question. All right. Listen, that's all the time we have for segment one. We're going to move on. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot more to address when we talk about this team in particular. Always a pleasure, Frankie. All right, we're back, and we're talking about the rest of the teams. We've already gone over what we've seen from the Mothman. We, Mothman, we've already talked about the roadies and their conundrum. Uh, so let's get right into Team Tully, uh, the uh, Biltmore drivers who we have not really seen a ton of. So we saw Ian Plunny uh, in preseason action before the draft. We saw Colin after the draft. We have yet to really see them together, and we really have yet to see anybody else. So real quick, the roster in round one, we saw Ian Tully come off the board. In round two, we saw rookie James McDermott, a bit of a wild card, somebody we really don't know anything about. Uh, then we saw in round three, uh, center of the year, Joe Labo. Round four, we saw Ray Sullivan. And round five, we saw... Who did we see in round five? Oh, John, John A., a. the a. final pick of the draft. How could you ever forget Mr. Nay? Uh, so... Early impressions of this team. Obviously, we know a lot of speed. Uh, Ian, you have... Ian's not here. Um, (laughs) 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 All right. Uh, Yeah, we've got inside information on what James McDermott looks like here uh, with uh, Jerry. Jerry, let us know what you know about James. Now, from what we know, he's... uh... He comes from an athletic family with... uh... He played... Football actually at the varsity level in a high school setting, which uh, neither of the Tully boys ever had. So right. in, in that facet of the game, he's actually more experienced in the so ins and outs. And you and think he was worth the second round pick? I would certainly say so if they wanted to get him on the team. It's usually when you want to feature something in an offense or a defense, whether it's a hands team or somebody for their speed being fleet of foot then, you know, you try to assemble pieces around those. And Does, I think they drafted for defense more than anything else. Do you think, because we don't know who the quarterback of this team is, at least with this team there's plenty of options, unlike the roadies, but do you think he has a chance to play quarterback, or was that not why he was taken? I think that he certainly could. I don't think that there's any shortage of uh, at least length for uh, an arm on the team. Right. But I think uh, narrowing down that decision would be much more difficult than really having to select the one right person. Because I know he does have feet, and uh, I I think he could throw the ball pretty well. In my talks with Colin, Colin said, you know, it's it's basically going to be a a 90% rushing offense. But he said he's going to give it a go early here in, you know, preseason scrimmage action at quarterback. And we saw his arm a little bit on display on Sunday. He's, He's got a good enough arm. He takes off with his legs. He does all the things right. The question is the decision-making process, and the question is what is this offense really going to look like? I mean, if he's talking about it being run first, you know, what is the passing game going to look like? Is it all going to be off play action? Is it all going to be off weird formations? Or are they going to spread people out because of all that speed? I mean, you you got an up-close view of, of Colin this week, Peter. I mean, what did you see out of him? He impressed me. You know, being the yep. only guy who was able to show up for his team, he, he, had, he topped on with the roadie squad. And uh, when when he lined up as quarterback, you know he was making an impression for sure. And I, uh, I mean, I think I think part of the problem here is we're probably not going to see anybody other than Ian or Colin Tully at these scrimmages. I mean, Joe Labo he makes his classic one or two appearances, plays about four snaps, and then he goes and sits on the sideline for the rest of the day. And Joe's one of those guys; he's got the talent. Oh, there's no question. If he shows up. You know, he'll be game day ready, but we just need to see more of him. We know we're not going to see Ray Ray Sullivan on Sundays. We'll see him on Wednesdays. We saw him today. He looked really good. He looked like he's staying in game shape. He he made an unbelievable one-handed catch. But, hey, that's not team practice. You know, that's just one-on-one drills. And we know we're probably not going to see John A. uh, because of the court case. So he's more than Mm, likely. Still pending. Right, still pending, of course. So the question is, without, without any practice time together, how does this team look on game day? We get a little bit of insight into that with what we saw from Team Tully last year, from the drivers last year, which was no practice time other than Frank and Ian, and they go out and win a championship. So obviously I don't think it's not possible, but this team doesn't have Frank Samisa. This team doesn't have that that playbook and that system. So what do they need to do, in your opinion, Jerry, to kind of supplement for what Frank did for them last year? What they need to do is get into – there's no – 
ban or limit on off-field organizing, and right. that will be key to deciding the actual uh, events on game day. Yeah, I totally agree with you, and that's a little bit of what Frank and Ian did last year anyway. It's active coordination, and from what I hear, they've been in contact with at least <clears throat> uh, three-quarters to 90% of their team on an everyday basis, but there's an X factor that, as according to Time Magazine, is rumored to be uh, Mr. John A. Right, we know John A. with the court case and with what he's going on at home, you know, what he has going on at home. He's, he's not going to be able to be there very often, if at all. And I don't know that it hurts this team, but, but that's a, a conversation for a different day. I think, for me, what I need to see out of this team is I need to see Ian there every week, which we know we're going to see, and I need to see at least, you know, we know we'll get Colin when he's off the boat. I need to see Joe Labo at least two or three times because Joe Labo could end up being that missing piece at quarterback if, if they wanted to. He's got the arm strength. He's got the talent, but... Are we going to see him? I, I I doubt it very much. He has the acumen. He is the, if I'm not mistaken, most winningest player in in league champion history. Behind Frank and Justin, yes, he has I five see. rings, five. Um, which is crazy. He's got a positive win percentage. Not a lot of people have that. What really um, stuck out to me was uh, the fact that Colin was able to bring back two of his main guys from last year's yeah, championship very, team. very, very important. So let's see if they can take off where, where they left off. All right, so we're going to move on to Team Dan, the Puspatuck Smokes. And first thing we have to obviously address is that the Smokes really are just a, a terribly run franchise for the past two years. One point in the last two tournaments. Let me repeat that. One point. In the last two tournaments, you almost have to try to do that. It's very, very hard to do. Dan O'Shea thinks, Coach Dan O'Shea thinks he's nipped that in the bud by taking Frank Samisa number one overall. But even Frank has his limits. How can he How can he turn around this franchise? How can he get points on the board? And how can he kind of flip the script? Now, from a, a front office perspective, it seems that Dan has kind of taken the... Uh luxury tax owner's uh, <laughs> perspective of I've drafted my guy I've got kind of a you know a franchise in a box I'm just going to let him thrive right, and right. A, a hands-off approach but as we know for team dynamics that can really be a detriment <laughs> and with somebody with experience in a, a veteran sense in a locker room I go over to uh, Peter. Yeah, I think, you know, he drafted great. He had the first round pick of every round. I think him getting J.J. in the second round. Oh, huge. That, you know, no one saw that happening come draft day. And, you know, he's got the likes of Nick Jirasi in the third round. We know Frank and Nick have their, you know, they've had their uh, squabbles in the past. For getting sure. a guy like Jesus in the fourth round. He's got the speed. He's got the hands. Made a game-winning pick last year um, yeah. against Team Dan. Now he yeah. plays for pick him six. this year. Um, and then Kevin in the fifth Kevin round. Kevin in the fifth round. Again, a guy that no one saw falling to the fifth. No, the draft fell in Dan's hands perfectly. Those There's are no blue question. chip stocks. Yeah, totally. That he collected on his team. The, the problem here is that if Dan thinks he's going to sit back and Frank's just going to whisk them away to victory, Holmes saw two years ago that that's not how it works. You don't just you don't just draft Frank and he'll, he'll fix everything just because he's there. There has to be a commitment. And as the reason Frank asked for the trade from Team Holmes, you know, those years ago is because Frank felt... There was no commitment, and that starts with the coach. So if, if all of a sudden the team dynamic begins to disappear a little bit, people start to not show up, Frank's going to look to Dan, and if Dan's not setting the example, you're going to have that team homes all over again. Frank's going to want out. So it's it's on Dan to really make sure that these guys are committed, and so far that has not been an issue. Kevin's been unbelievable. Jesus has been unbelievable. Jirasi had two touchdowns last week. Uh, JJ's JJ. I mean, this team's going to be scary. We saw the offense basically not mm. stall whatsoever. And we saw the defense come up with stops. This right now is the team to beat. I know Team Holmes looked good, but Team Team Dan looked better. The Moth the Mothmen they weren't able to score at the clip they were able to score with against Smokes. So there's 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 going to be a lot to see here, and I'm excited to see it. Uh, they certainly get a, a a gold star for coordination thus far in the uh, that's what that's what a season process. That's what a Frank Samisa led team is going to look like. They're going to be organized. They're going to be ready to go. All right, and coming up next, we're going to have the interview, the one on one interview with Coach Holmes. We're excited to get to that. Uh, we'll see you in a little bit. All right, we're back and we're here with the good old coach for our interview with him, John Sadam, the uh, coach of the Mothmen, the owner of the Mothmen, the GM of the Mothmen. And we're going to get straight into it. Are you happy to be here, though, Coach? Uh, yes, Frankie. I just wanted to let you know I, I can't be here long. I have an event to get to. <laughs> I'm sure you do. All right. My first question for you is uh, obviously you win the championship two seasons ago. 
and we noticed a, a huge difference in your style of coaching last year and going into this year. What lessons did you take away from that team, the championship winning team, whether it was from Justin O'Shea or Frank Samisa? What has changed your coaching style? So basically, Frankie, the only way to be better is to put time in on the field, okay? Not only on the field, but you need to be working on your playbook when you're at home. So usually I just lay in bed in the morning and I just look at my plays and, and I go over them the, the night after or the day after that uh, I have a good practice. Sure. Oh, great. Hey, could, could you run us through the thought process of taking a I'm guy... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just had a quick phone oh, call. Okay. Could um, you run us through the thought process of taking uh, a guy like Renzo Lavazette in the first round, which many people thought originally could be a stretch at the third overall pick, but it seems to be working out great for you. People you thought you were going to take J.J. What made you go with So, I, you know, obviously J.J. is a you know, good-looking player. Uh, he plays <laughs> well. He is good-looking, by the way. But... <laughs> You have to build your foundation from a quarterback standpoint. So it, I, w- I could have taken J.J. first round, and maybe my team would have looked exactly the same besides him and, and Renzo, but then who was going to throw the ball? It's not going to be me. Fair. Got you. Um, all right, so Josh Paini, he's been in the league for four seasons. Every single one of those seasons he's played for Team Holmes. What is it about Josh that makes you want to keep him around, A, and B, what growth have you seen from him as a player and teammate? So basically, I, I groomed that kid from an infancy. Okay, <laughs> so he was not looking good the first year or two he was playing. But, you know, I gave that kid a shot. And the difference with Josh is I can call him on the phone and tell him I need him to be there, and he'll sure. be there. If I don't call him, he probably won't. But <laughs> he'll be there if I need him to, and he's been learning and doing better. He gets better every year. All right, we're going to go to the fan mail bag. Uh Peter, I know you've got one from the fans. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are wondering, you know, we saw Matt King in practice. You had a good look at him in a few scrimmages, but taking a shot on a rookie in the third round pick, what did you see that you liked in him out there? I just saw speed, and, and I knew uh, through a few people, Frank Samisa and Ian, that he would be there every weekend, and that's what matters. That's what makes a winning team, and that's how you win a championship. Dedication. Uh, from Frank S. in Mastic, uh, what about your rivalry with Coach Dan? It's not really much of a rivalry anymore. It's more <laughs> of a domination, I would put it that way. I mean, the kid, uh, there was talks about him quitting. He did for a little while. I, I Look, I feel bad for the guy. I really <laughs> just hope that he can find what he's looking for in life, and he should probably give up football in general. All right, this one from Alicia D. on Long Island. Um, have you ever, are you currently, taking performance-enhancing drugs? There's been some allegations. That I couldn't, I, I can't lie, that's 100% yes. I get, <laughs> I'm on a T, I am on a TRT program. I have low hormones, uh, specifically testosterone, and, and I do get um, testosterone injections by my doctor. Okay, so these are legal steroids. Yes, 100%. I'll show you the script if you need to see it. All right, from Anonymous, do you still know my body? I will always know Dingo's body, <laughs> and it will never change. Uh, it's been surprising me now and then. Uh, actually, lately, it's been surprising me a lot, but uh, I do know his body well. All right, the last question I've got for you, Coach, and we're very happy that you were here today. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that you did oh, this for me. As long as, yeah, i got to be out of here soon. Okay, so. last question. I don't want to hold you. You've been a part of LOL football for 10 seasons now. Yes. How has the league evolved? What does your role in the league mean to you, and, and what does LOL in general mean to, to Coach Holmes? Uh, basically, so even Frank Samisa says this, the league, I mean, there's a few people like this. The league would not go on without a few a few of the core people, and I, I will admit that I'm one of them, and it's it's just grown as people take it more seriously. The the morale is high. We, we just had our 10-year anniversary. I, I just, I couldn't see my life going on without it, and I hope that it continues for another 10 years. Holmes, we really appreciate you being here. Thanks for everything Coach, you do, man. One more from the gallery. Yeah, sure. Uh, rumors around the... Uh... The, the news buzz in the media is that you've been looking to capitalize on the Nick Del Monte discontent. Any comment? Yeah, um, you know, I'm always looking to make a good trade, uh, but it has to be worth my while, and um, the time has to be right. But, you know, Macca's my dude, and that's it. 
<laughs> All right, Holmes, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Thanks, good old coach. All right, that's going to do it for the podcast today, our first podcast, the inaugural podcast. Uh, quick shout-outs to our Legends of Legion website. Check it out, and if you have any fan <laughs> questions... <laughs> If you have any questions that you want to ask on next week's episode, check out the Instagram. It's uh, Legends at Legends of Legion. Everybody have a great night. Most motherfucker, yeah, it's me. I'm a G. Pizza perks and pussies, all I need. All I need. Swoop down and crush them bitches from a tray. Let them say, if your children, they go missing, that was me.